Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about the Faraday waves, um, and that is a picture from simulations. And um, this uh, Faraday is the same as the one who did the uh, electric, the cages and all that, but this is different. He did also a shaking, uh, shaking layer of fluid, and if you shake it with enough amplitude, it forms, um, it forms standing waves, and like this here. Uh, let's see. Or else like this. And um, here is um, here are some patterns that are from the, the usual uh, crystalline patterns, uh, stripes and squares and um, hexagons uh, are all possible, usual basic patterns you see in convection and everything else. But it's just a shaken layer of fluid and surface waves. And this is a film from uh, our computations. This is a square wave pattern. So you see, here's the maximum, and now it becomes a minimum. And now that's it becomes a maximum, you know, as square waves do. This is the domain with periodic quantum? This is, okay. Yes, thank you for asking that. It is, but what's more, this is a cheat because uh, the calculation is in this domain here, and it's repeated. Um, so uh, we're not getting a big pattern of it. We're just getting one square wave at this time. Later, there'll be other things. G is the gravitational acceleration. So this is, ah, yes, okay, so good. I'm glad you asked that. Um, the way it's done numerically or theoretically is not with changing boundary conditions, but in a frame that moves with it. So it's gravity that um, it's, 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 it says it comes, the shaking becomes an oscillating gravity in a stationary frame, right? Okay, so that's the gravity there, and that is the. Can you solve no, this is fully viscous, fully viscous, and uh, so maybe uh, uh, I'll be showing that shortly. Yes, this is. In fact, this is the first uh, viscous uh, 3D simulation of Faraday. Okay, so oh yeah, this is the movie. Okay, so. Um, so indeed, it's the first viscous simulation, and that is because everything, okay, uh, I come from a tradition of studying hydrodynamic instabilities, pattern formation, where the prototypes are Rayleigh-Bernard thermal convection and taylor Couette flow between concentric rotating cylinders. And uh, the, uh, we all know the pioneering experiments of Couette and the explanations by Taylor, that was in uh, 1890s. And in the 1923 was the famous paper by Taylor and for convection by Baynard around, uh, again, the uh, late 19th century and the pioneering explanation by Rayleigh in 1916. So those are, what, those are the things that happened. And then after that, when computers were introduced, uh, that was among the first things, PDEs that were solved. And in two dimensions, that happened about in the 1960s, late 1960s. Um, and then three dimensions in around the 1980s when that became possible. But although Faraday waves were, the experiment that I described was uh, 1831, so before the convection and Taylor Couette, the first inviscid linear stability analysis was in 1954, so a long time after this Rayleigh and Taylor things from the 1920s, um, maybe in the year uh, 2500, it won't, will seem around the same time, but it still seems like a very different time to us. And uh, the first viscous stability analysis was done in 1994, and I'll tell you about that. And then the first 2D simulations were done in the years 2000 and 2009. So much later than these. And it's because of this delay that we got to be first to do this. This, um, this, uh, this is Krishna Kumar, and since I'm here in India, uh, this is a picture of Krishna Kumar from, and I know it's a common name, he's the one from Karangpur. Did I say it right? Yes, Karangpur, yes. So, so this was my colleague in this, that's this Kumar. I know it's a common name, so I wanted you to know which one it was. And um, in, he, this is a, I got this off of Google. I think he looks, some, probably looks older now, but um, <laughs> this is, okay. So in 1994, um, uh, uh, we did the first uh, viscous stability analysis. First, I'll start with the first inviscid stability analysis. That was by Benjamin, that's Brooke Benjamin, um, uh, in 1954. He saw that the, um, the stability problem for these waves was, could be mapped exactly onto the Matthew equation, the famous Matthew equation, and the instability could be described by tongues. Now, this here is, a, uh, this is wave number, 
and this is acceleration. So what we're saying is that inside these areas here, the, uh, and for an acceleration of this, you have instability to e to the i k dot x, a plane wave with that k, okay? And this says, um, subharmonic SHH, 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 S -H -H, um, S -H, subharmonic, harmonic, and those were the demonstrations I was doing just now. Um, okay, so this is the, the layer, and the subharmonic is like this. So you see the period is twice what my feet are doing, and the harmonic is this. Okay, so you see that both of them make physical sense, it makes sense these motions that I'm doing. And um, so a lot of people did approximate phenom phenomenological um, uh, adaptations of the Matthew equation until then, but we did, we solved the full uh, Navier-Stokes equations with viscosity, and we saw something that had also been seen, of course, in the qualitative phenomenological adaptations, which is to say that the bottom of the tongues no longer hit the, uh, the axis, you need a finite acceleration to uh, have this pattern. They, so they, they round and also they vary uh, in amplitude with the um, uh, uh, with um, viscosity like that. And uh, then, said, continuing in this history, um, the first 2D simulations were done in 2000, by Chen Wu, and we got to do the first 3D simulations just in 2009. So just 10 years ago were the first simulations. So this is now um, an honest uh, picture. The other one was repeated uh, periodically, but this is the domain of calculation, and you see here the uh, square wave. You see the velocity field as well. Um, generally, when uh, the surface is most distended, that's when the velocity is least, and vice versa. Okay, so how do we solve this? Um, well, I can just show it using the Matthew equation. Um, Benjamin and Ursel, uh, uh, the um, Okay, since it's homogeneous in, in these directions, the solutions to a linear problem are necessarily trigonometric in the homogeneous directions. So they go like e to the i k dot x for some k there, and for arbitrary form, it's uh, just a sum. This is linear analysis again. And because of the periodic forcing, it's a flow k problem. So it's a linear problem, yes, but with periodic coefficients, and hence the solution for each fixed k of the uh, spatial wave number, it's a Fourier, it's a Floquet problem, and hence has the solution of being uh, this, a solution which is um, a periodic function with the same period as the forcing. This omega is the frequency of the forcing times um, a um, an ex arbitrary exponential. That is the general Floquet form. Um, this is the Matthew equation that was derived by Benjamin and Ursel, and there are. Uh, uh, there's, uh, the, the criticality is for mu equals zero, so there's no growth and no decay, and there are two possibilities. Uh, it turns out you could have thought that flo from Floquet theory, alpha could be arbitrary, but for this problem, there are only two possible values, which is alpha um, equals zero or alpha equals omega over two, meaning we have the harmonic or the subharmonic. This is, you don't change the period, you have the same period, and this is, you have twice the period, half the frequency. And um, so this is, this is the situation. This is, um, um, so this is the same picture we saw before. This is K, the wave number, and this is A. I re remind you how they appear here. Um, uh, the K appears inside this omega naught, uh, and the A appears here. It's the amplitude of the forcing. Yes, indeed. Ah, is that why? Okay, no, no, I, I, um, I may have heard an explanation as to one point about why it was only those values, but I, if so, I didn't retain it, or I may never have heard it, so I will be uh, interested to hear how that, how that works. Thank you. But we also find the same thing when it's not time reversed, when there's viscosity. So, but, well, still, there might be something there. Okay, so this is now... This is uh, how the flow K analysis works. These are the tongues, and this is subharmonic, harmonic, subharmonic, harmonic. Um, and let me show you then the two. This is the flow K exponent, and this is the flow K multiplier. Uh, the Matthew equation is a second order equation. So, like all second order equations, it has two solutions, meaning here, two expo here, um, two, two of these. And so I've drawn them here on the unit circle. It's this one's time reverse. So the it's uh, the uh, uh, multipliers are on the unit circle. The 
uh, exponents are on the imaginary axis. Okay, so this is this, and that's at this point here. And now I'm going to move along. This is poor man's movie, uh, moving along in K, and you see the multipliers moving together, and now they meet at minus one, and now they have to sum the multipliers have to multiply to one because of uh, it being invested in uh, phase volume preserving, and so one goes outside, one goes inside. And that is when you have instability because one, one being outside, that means that the multiplier, it's being multiplied by uh, something greater than one in absolute value. And you keep going inside the tongue, it becomes more and more unstable. And now they meet again at minus one. And now they cross the, in the complex way, they're going across the, the circle here as you go across here. And now they're gonna meet at one. And that's the beginning of a harmonic tongue. And then they're gonna exit at uh, one plus something and one minus something, and then they meet again, and then they go uh, they go back again. So that's that's how uh, that's how uh, Floquet analysis Matthew equations work. And the way we solve the uh, problem, um, I, again I can illustrate it on the um, Matthew equation. Let us write this periodic function. I wrote it that way before. This is usually written just as a periodic function with capital T, the same period as the oscillation. Uh, but I've written it now in explicit Fourier form. And the reason I did that is so as to write the Fourier components as a vector here. And um, so now I rewrite the equation, and I see that we have most terms that do not mix the different Fourier components. The only one that mixes them is this cosine term. So we rewrite this equation, bringing the cosine term to the right, and the other terms all to the left. This is just this equation is just the interface equation. It's the same one that says um, it's the same one that says that the balloon, you know, the um, the pressure inside minus pressure outside uh, is surface tension, right? The jump in, in pressure. I think they call that Laplace's equation, right? I mean, there must be many things that are Laplace's equation, but the jump in pressure delta p is is the, uh, the surface tension force, right? That's that's what, so that's that's all that this is. This is surface tension, sigma, and that's a curvature term. And this is turns, it's a change in pressure, delta. That's all that this equation is. Anyway, these terms do not mix the different time components, and this one does. So you end up with this equation for um, the Fourier vector, the vector of Fourier components. And you see that that is an eigenvalue, the amplitude here of the cosine is an eigenvalue for this uh, problem. So this is rare to set up things this way. Usually when we look at hydrodynamic stability problems as eigenvalue problems, it's usually the growth rate that is the eigenvalue. And you, you, you put in your conditions, you put in your A, and what you get out is your mu, your growth rate. And then you interpolate different A's to get the mu equals zero. But this is not that way. We put in the mu, mu is in the equation and, uh, as, as zero, and, um, and we get out the A. So we get out right away the uh, amplitudes. And this pr procedure works for other problems too. It's, also, it's been applied a lot uh, to convection others by some uh, recent um, articles I've seen. Yes? I'm sorry, say again? Yes, yes indeed. Well, uh, yes, and we'll, we'll get to that, I think. Uh, but I can say just for the moment that instead of K here, I could have, this is a varying k with omega fixed. And I could have instead fixed k and varied omega and seen the same thing uh, qualitatively. But yes, there is one. And we'll get to it in, in just a moment. Yes? This is actually a generalized hydrodynamic. No. Because you've got a matrix on the right. But it's invertible, so it doesn't matter. The, each of these is invertible. So you can, uh, I mean, generalized eigenvalue problem is only different from eigenvalue problem when one of the matrices is uh, non in, uh, singular. Um, okay, so indeed, this is what I say here, that the usual procedure is to input this, uh, the, the uh, forcing parameter, like the Rayleigh number, the Reynolds number, the whatever, and get out the growth rate. And in this procedure, instead, we put in the, um, that the growth rate is zero, and we get out the forcing amplitude, the parameter, the, the forcing parameter, the one that you have to put in to get criticality. And uh, at the time I wrote this, can other stability problems, and then I've seen that recently, I've seen other people solve them using uh, in this way. Okay, is that clear? I'm gonna go on to other things. But I'll get to the uh, dispersion relation uh, shortly. So surface tension is not necessary? No, it's, no. Or does it qualitatively change? I would say no. I would say it's only so quantitative. 
is this, that's right. Everything, in fact, it's, it really, in fact, doesn't matter. Everything is through, but I guess I should have written the dispersion relation first. No, this, everything is through this, this um, okay, I can write it. In fact, I'll just write it here. Um, you can write, for the inviscid problem, you can write, So uh, you for uh, so, so uh, you have this is, this is deep water, right? it's arbitrary. Oh oh no no that's right that's right because I didn't put in the H that's right that's right that's right it's not a shallow uh, it is deep water uh, that's right and um, uh, what was I going to say yes so whether you do your effect through G or through sigma uh, it's the same you can for you can do just capillary waves you can do just gravity waves or you can do a combination. And most of our calculations have been uh, computation. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yes, indeed, I showed you already this picture. The result of the stability analysis in um, that I did with Krishna Kumar, and then Kumar found this uh, result that uh, was a surprising one in 1996. Everyone had always seen that the subharmonic tongue was the uh, most important one. It's the widest. It's the lowest. So you always got subharmonic instability. But no, he found that for some physical parameters. Uh, this harmonic tongue went down, the subharmonic went up, and you would get harmonic uh, instability as the first one. So that's his result from 96. Um, now, all this activity in the mid-90s started because of the dis experimental discovery of uh, quasi-patterns. Uh, and here is, uh, this is an experimental picture, uh, and this was done in France. Uh, Stéphane Fauve is French, and Stuart Edwards had come uh, uh, from uh, University of Texas at Austin to work with Fulv, and they found pa patterns that looked like this. So you look and you see that this is not straight rolls, it is not squares, it is not hexagons, it is uh, something complicated. It's like a quasi-crystal, it's got order, but it's not repeated. And we'll see these in a little, uh, in a little while uh, more about this. And um, then this started off a whole industry of seeing all kinds of patterns. Uh, this, these were super lattices seen by Kudrali, Pierre, and Golub in 1990. Again, the same, pro same thing. You have um, short range, uh, you have different, uh, several different spatial wave numbers. And then we applied this technique also to the, um, to the problem. Now, but first let me say, how did they get these? Yeah. Um, they did this by, um, you know, so you, let's see. Yeah, you see this? this, pic, this uh, dispersion relation here, right? So you can see this dispersion relation two ways. This was derived by Lamb, and then uh, 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 sometimes called Lamb-Rayleigh. Um, so this is early uh, 20th century. And what they, he was saying was that if you, um, if you excite a surface, if you, make a, if you make a plane wave in the surface, then it will bounce at that frequency. So input the, input the spatial wave number, you, you draw an initial condition that's like this, and it will do this or this, depending on how you did that. But you can also look at it the other way. That is to say, if you impose the frequency, if you shake, then what comes out is a spatial wave number. Okay. So now you can see that by, uh, here are two different the excitations. It's not just co cosine omega t, it's two different frequencies. And from that, you might think that you get two different spatial wave numbers. It's really kind of a leap why, you know, that it should be linear like this. Why should you get out, uh, you, know, you, you program your, your, your accelerator to do this, just a sum of different frequencies, and you get two different uh, spatial wave numbers. But that was their idea, Edwards and Fulv, and it turned out to be the case. Here is a picture of a quasi-pattern, and you see that there are two different, um, two different spatial wave numbers. These are them the purple line and the blue line. You see how this is one, one uh, spatial length, and this is another one. And they're both, um, excuse me, let me. These are, these are the corresponding wave numbers, and two different, uh, two different um, uh, uh, radii there. And if you do the stability analysis, the tongues, uh, let's go, this psi thing is called mixing angle. It brings you smoothly from here from here to here, if you have psi equals zero, you have just this. If you have psi equals 90 degrees, you have just this. And so let's go in between, and that's doing this. So you see that you start off with just a regular diagram. You end up with just a regular diagram, although it's shifted. This is, these are the two different, uh, two different critical, the two different k's that come out basically of this relation from the different omegas. And you might think that what happens 
two, there are two, several ways of going from here to here. One way you could imagine is these tongues just shift. Or you could imagine that a set go up and then another set come down. But in fact, it's this complicated, very specific thing. As you add more and more of this, you see some other system of tongues. You see the little ones come down. You see even an azola of excitation here. Not a tongue. It doesn't go up here. And then this coming down more, and you have all this topology. They, they, they meet. They do all this complicated stuff. And then finally, you have here uh, the same, the same uh, uh, um, acceleration amplitude uh, by critical point here for those two frequencies, but you see how, how weird the diagram looks. And then you keep going, and then those other tongues, these disappear. Oh, and then you get, um, uh, excuse me, then you get, um, uh, and then you just have the, that diagram. So it's very complicated. And I don't know if people have studied this. Um, I just have these numericals, but it seems to me that somebody could do, if it hasn't already been done, in the intervention. I don't think I ever saw any diagrams like this. People did, mathematicians sometimes did uh, something quasi-periodic where these were not commensurate, m omega, n omega. So the, uh, but these are commensurate. The x, it is a floquet problem. It is periodic with period uh, uh, 2 pi over omega. Um, and you have this complicated thing. And as I said, I don't know if, uh, if that's been studied, this, uh, these, these, these complicated things. Uh, and if not, it should be. Yes. Yes. That okay, and I think that has been studied a great deal. Uh, this this very thing that spawned a whole industry. Okay, so I showed this already. Um, yeah, but uh, right, that spawned a whole industry by all these mathematicians here um, on all kinds of mathematics about the about the ratios of the k's and what you could see, and a whole lot of experimental work, too. All this was in the mid-90s, mostly. So this is the, the most complicated bunch of pictures I've seen. And this is experimental work by Arbel and Feinberg. And this is with the ratio 2 to 3. And you see all these different, um, these different um, patterns. Let me go back to this uh, quasi-pattern picture here. Um, this picture here. Um, this is the same psi that brings you from here to here. It brings you from forcing all of m omega t to forcing all of l omega t, or n, uh, I think I changed between l and n, yeah. OK, all from this to this. And these, this is the threshold here, in, is, the, uh, is the, the radius of this line. So this is where you just have this. This is where you just have this, why it says lines. And then in between, you have, this is the, oh, that's the crossing point. Of the um, of the two, and that is indeed experimentally where you get the quasi pattern. So, so indeed, this is some 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 a kernel of the right explanation. To get more of a kernel, um, more than just a kernel, again, you'd have to study all these difficult articles: uh, Rutledge, Silber, um, Proctor, Skeldon. That's uh, Mike Proctor, Alastair Rutledge, uh, Anne Skeldon, Mary Silber, uh, and they all made a substantial. They wrote, oh, I don't know, each about 10 papers on this matter uh, that are difficult to read. I can't, I don't really claim to understand them. Group theory uh, with all these different things about, as you say, the, the Ks and the relationship between them and resonance and all kinds of stuff. So that's spawned a whole uh, thing there. And this is, the, this is the same kind of picture for the Arbel and Feinberg, that is to say, this is where you have only 50 hertz amplitude. This is where you have only 75 hertz. And then you're doing a superposition of the two and, you, and this, is the diagram, this is the phase diagram. If you have half and half, then you would go from rhomboids. Are they pictured here? I don't think so. Rhomboids to double hexagons. Are the double hexagons here? I think that might be this here. And then uh, all these other here, all these others based on how much by angle you have of the two and three and the amplitude of the forcing. So now we're finished with the two frequency forcing. Um, and um, right, are there questions about that? that we're not, we're not, OK, so now that's the end of two frequency. We're going to go back to, to one frequency force. So all this time, <coughs> we're going to talk about something very simple to understand. There had never been a method to do a spatiotemporal measure, experimental measurement of the surface. People just took pictures, like the pictures you just saw. But the idea of getting this function, psi, uh, the height, as a function of x, y, and t, this could not be done experimentally. You had a photograph, and you, you had the shape of vapor. But OK. So the first to do this were uh, <clears throat> a group of Wagner in 2005 
in Germany with um, these uh, co-workers here, uh, Kiddick and uh, Emson Koshinen, and they were the first to do a quantitative measure of it. And from that, when you uh, here's a square pattern and here's a hexagon, hexagonal pattern. And then if you have quantitative measurements, you can do a Fourier transform, a spatial Fourier transform. And indeed, we know that the spatial Fourier transform of a square pattern is a square pattern, and the spatial Fourier transform of a hexagonal pattern is a hexagonal pattern. There, I don't know what you call that, auto uh, self, uh, self, uh, yeah. Okay, so here they are. This is the this is the Fourier spectra of the experimental data, and that was the first time this was done. And so that is the article that was chosen by Nicolas Perrinet, who was my student, to compare with numerical simulations. The numerical technique I won't say much about because I don't. Uh, this was really done by my colleagues. In there, this is Navier Stokes with viscosity. And uh, so the, the, I'll say just a few things. One, they use a cubic mesh for the whole fluid. So they don't just have the interface. It's not a phase field model. It's, um, uh, it's not, what it, what it, you have cubic regular mesh. And then you have triangles that represent the surface. And in the cube, you have a viscosity and a density that depend, uh, you, that are one value for the uh, fluid and another value for the one above, for the air, okay? And that's why this is this mu is written um, uh, here inside because it varies with space. And the uh, <clears throat> you solve Navier Stokes on the whole thing, and then the fluid velocity advects the surface, and then the surface has a certain surface tension, and it acts on it. It, it makes changes the um, the Navier Stokes. So the uh, the triangles of the surface uh, change the motion of the fluid, and the motion of the fluid advects the uh, so uh, that's pretty much all I know about this. And these are the um, <clears throat> these are the results of his simulations. That is to say, this is just linear. But what he did was the he saw he implemented that method, and he um, he did it very close to threshold, and he got these thresholds. So this is very uh, very close to what to the those other things can be considered analytic that Floquet method. So he's very close to the threshold. But in addition, you can get the Floquet functions. Remember that the eigenvalue is the A, but the eigenvector is those Fourier coefficients. Fourier coefficients of what? Of the motion of the fluid. So the motion of the fluid is not trigonometric. It would be trigonometric at A equals 0, because then you wouldn't have the cos. It would be a constant coefficient equation with trigonometric solutions. But instead, since it's not a constant coefficient, but a periodic coefficient equation, it's a Floquet problem. And hence, the solution is a combination of periodic uh, Fourier series. And so the function looks more complicated than trigonometric. And when you get the A's, you also get those Fourier coefficients, and you can reconstruct the functional form. And these are the functional forms seen here and here and here for the first three tongues. So this is a subharmonic tongue. This is a harmonic tongue. This is a subharmonic tongue again. And these numbers here are the numbers of nodes in a period. So here you see one, here you see two, and here you see three. And then so he, uh, he did the squares. You've already seen. Oh, I don't know why. When I click here, it shows this. And when I click there, it shows the other one. Well, anyway, this is the square pattern. You already saw it before. And then what you didn't see was the hexagonal pattern. Um, whoops, um, shown here. I have to, yeah, somehow if I click on them. Um, so that's, that's like a chocolate uh, surface. Um, so that can keep your interest. Um, and that's indeed what's seen experimentally is you have squares at low amplitude, hexagons at higher amplitude, and he got both of those patterns. So now I'm going to switch just to hexagons. I'm going to talk about that for a while. And this is all the work of Nicolas Perrinet, who did all these numerical simulations that I'm talking about for the moment. So here are the hexagons with their chocolate, uh, if you see, isn't it nice? Um, and this is the domain in which he got the hexagons. Um, so this is a minimal domain to see hexagons, and it has a ratio of 1 to square root of 3. It's a rectangle 1 to square root of 3, and that's, you can complete that hexagon that way. And that is a, a, a domain, a minimum per periodic domain to, to get hexagons. So I, I lied when I said the experiments, it's true. They got squares at low amplitude and then hexagons at high amplitude. That's not what Nicolas did. What Nicolas did is he did simulations in a square container, and there he had squares. And he did simulations in a container like this, and there he had hexagons. So you guide the system and make it do that. Later, I'll talk about unguided systems. These simulations are done with a finite depth. Yes, yes, they are. They are. And, uh, you put about a, about a 
the yes, no, uh, no slip, no slip here. Uh, I mean, you can see, look how um, it's, it's not, I mean, as it happens, that experiment that we were matching had very, very low, uh, very, very thin layer. Look, look at that. That's realistic. So in fact, it's surprising it works at all. How many grid points are here? Maybe five. Uh, so it's uh, rather surprising that it w works if we yeah. it Uh, no, no, it, it starts to be chaotic and to melt and do do different things. Yeah, that's right. You can't trust the, or you can still trust the linear analysis. No, the linear stability analysis only tells you about the linear instability. The the nonlinear code does everything the fluid would do. It's a perfect experiment. And then it would show It would show whatever the experiment showed. Although in this case, uh, so far, again, this is a kind of cheat because the, the this the domain is this big. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the moment, that we'll we'll change that shortly. Yes. I'm, many people have done that. I don't know anything about it. Um, this is um, this was yeah. Many many people did that. I put him with the theory, but um, yeah, Vignal is here. Uh, this is nonlinear, uh, weekly nonlinear, and uh, Zhang and Vignal's a whole bunch of papers. There's been a tremendous uh, Miles and Henderson, and there's a whole literature. But since I don't do that, uh, I don't know anything about it. But yeah, huge, huge literature. Yes, you get you you necessarily do it. the The box is made to get um, come on, made to get hexagonal pattern, that ratio. Uh huh. Yes. I'll say that um, I'll say that the viscosity presence of viscosity uh, is a quantitative and not a qualitative change. I'm not sure of that, but that's what I'll say. No, no, it does not. It does not. Definitely not. Um, uh, it it um, well, you can see here. I mean. Here, sir, certainly not, because this is the floor. <laughs> so, um, no, it, it's definitely not, and you'll see more pictures that are asymmetric uh, shortly. Uh, I'm sorry. Say again. If you have a thicker layer, thicker layer, thicker layer would uh, everything would be different. But again, I'm going to say quantitatively and not qualitatively. I, I would say, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is his uh, simulation. It's fairly modest, actually. This is the number of grid points, and this is the low uh, uh, row one and new one on the below, row two, new two above. The grid is about twice as dense as what's shown here, um, and uh, it's just Navier Stokes and uh, surface tension. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, though this may be mostly, though I think it's actually silicon oil sometimes. But the sort of the density ratio doesn't affect the numerics. No, no, not. I mean, my colleagues, again, I've had very little to do with the numerics. My colleagues are specialists in this. And so uh, presumably their methods, uh, I mean, I suppose that you could push it uh, where rho over rho was so big or so small that, um, you, that you couldn't, but this is OK. Um, okay, this is the velocity field for the hexagons. Uh, again, this is what I was saying, how um, uh, this is where, now this is going to make a peak, so it looks like a volcano here. Here, everything is going to come, this is everything rushing and then going to come down. Um, this, is, this thing is going to come down uh, because there's going to be velocity that pushes it, the, um, pushes it down. It's just to show that we get velocity fields as well as the surface. In addition, here you see it's spreading out because this is going to go splat, and uh, so it's going to make the fluid uh, go there. And when here it's about to go, here it's going in because it's it's. Uh, if you stare at these things long enough, you can figure it out. 
Okay, so again, these are now pictures. This is just nice color of those hexagonal uh, patterns. And so you were talking about the symmetry. You can see it's quite asymmetric. This is over a period. T over four and three T over four are not at all images of one another uh, flipped uh, top and bottom. This is, uh, these are these high peaks. They're not, they're different from a sinusoidal shape. They're much, much higher. And this is the other uh, periodicity here. And he, uh, again, this is the opposite periodicity. Um, where indeed the max has, this is a max here and this is a min here, but that's all they have in common. Um, they really don't look like mirror images of one another. It's not at all sinusoidal. Okay, so you see those four pictures, and now you're going to see something complicated. Um, this is now an oscillation in time. This, uh, this is the subharmonic pattern, so you're not surprised to see um, there's these four, you know, that's, that's what I was showing you before. So you see already there's two, uh, two different kinds of max, one like this and one like this, and two different kinds of min. And so that's, um, that's what's being shown here, two, two kinds of minima, two kinds of maxima. And those are the four pictures that you just saw here, one, two, three, four. This is one kind of max and max and one, uh, two kinds of max, two kinds of min. And then these are, the kind, these are just projected, these are the same things, but projected the contour plots. That's okay? There, okay, so, uh, and this is an envelope of the response. This is just the height, the maximum of the height as a function of time. So um, uh, this is over the excitation periods. And now we're just going to plot the envelope and look what happens. Uh, what happens is after a long, long time, after 40 oscillation periods, you, you would have thought it was hexagons. It looks pretty flat here, but by here it's not flat and it changes pretty abruptly to doing something else that we call beaded stripes. So here's its stripes, two, 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 and then beads left and right. Okay, so beads and stripes, and they have certain kind of symmetry if you look at them here, uh, Y reflection and shift and reflect. And then you might think this is very flat, so you think that's finished, but Nicolas Perrine had a lot of patience and was very curious, and he kept going, and then it's not permanent. It starts to change to something else that looks kind of like hexagons, but not exactly. You see that uh, it looks, it doesn't look like this. It looks much more like this. It has these white uh, round areas like this, but they're not exactly round. These are kind of triangular. That's what we call them quasi hexagons. They're, they're, they have these round patches surrounded by about six things, one and one, two, three, four, five, six, like hexagons, but they don't have all the symmetry of hexagons. Um, and you can see it's about to do something. Just so I understand, what you're saying is all patterns are cycle that goes through. Exactly, that's right. Each of these points here is not a steady state. It's, it has underlying oscillations like here. And so, uh, so this regime can be looked at as uh, this. That's right, a cycle like that. Exactly, exactly, that's right. Each, each one has a regime. And then uh, the, it looks like that. And then it's still not finished. It does some other thing that we call asymmetric beaded stripes, which has less symmetry than this one. Uh, if you looked at it carefully, I don't have time to say that. And then it's going to do some other kinds of quasi hexagons. And they're not the same because you see that this pattern here is at a different, it knows the temporal phase. It knows the temporal phase because you're doing this. So it makes a difference where you're, whether you're at the first maximum or the second maximum. And so you see this is taking place at the three, po three t over four, and here it's taking place at t over four, and also the space has changed a little bit. It's not exactly the same because this is now moved up there, and it's got again this complicated. Uh, there's a, a t uh, th this is and that are related by spa by spatial temporal symmetry. So it is a complicated mathematical object. It's a nice object for those who like this kind of stuff. And so we wondered, um, you know, how to look at this, and I don't think we have a complete picture of it. Yet, uh, but this is yeah because you what you were saying how each of these each of these things is four different phases. We could look at a strobed movie of just t over four, just t over two, just three t over four, just two t. And here it is. Here's the strobed movie at the four different periods. So here you only see you don't see the underlying oscillations. It stripes and then it's going to be quasi hexagons. See, it's straight, uh, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, quasi hexagons. Beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, quasi hexagons. Beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, quasi hexagons. 
Okay, so it is very complicated, and this, you know, it's just a fluid doing it. We didn't, we didn't put it in. It, this is just Navier-Stokes doing this. And so we did an analysis using Fourier spectra, um, which I'd like to show, but I, uh, but I have a few other topics to show you, so I don't know, maybe, um, okay, am I allowed to go over by five or 10 minutes, or? Yeah, you say that, but does everybody else think that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know it, it's tiring to listen to things. I I know, um, but okay. So I'll I'll take that as encouragement and just go on. Okay, so this is the physical domain, and this is the um, uh, this is the Fourier domain. And as we said, the uh, dual of the physical hexagon is a Fourier hexagon, Fourier motion. So here, uh, a hexagonal pattern is made up of. Um, oh, of, of modes on a hexagon, this, 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 and their conjugates, this, this, and this. So brown, blue, black, not this. Brown, blue, black, and over here. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And since it's got harmonics, uh, you form many hexagons from that. That's the, that's the basic one, and then you can do one, two, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then, and so on. Okay, that's just plain hexagons. And in, oh, and indeed, over here, you see the Fourier spectrum at the hexagonal period time, and it's a hexagonal. Uh, this is the amplitude is shown by the colors, and this is the two-dimensional Fourier, um, uh, Fourier spectrum, and you see it's a hexagonal lattice. Good, that's what you'd expect. Now you go to the beaded stripes. Okay, and let me say again, all this is the work of Nicolas Perrine. If you ever get a chance, if you ever hear of him, you, uh, you know, I, I understand it, I explain it, we talked about it, but it's really all him, including the ideas. Um, so stripes, you expect to just have uh, these two Fourier modes, up and down, k and minus k. That's what makes stripes, e to the i k x plus e to the minus i k x. You know, you get cosines, and there they go. But you have these two, and those are the beads, right? So you have the stripes in this direction, and then, then you have some variation in this direction, which is weaker. You have those beads, and that's what's this. Now it goes on and becomes the quasi-hexagons, and you see that this Fourier spectrum looks, I mean, it doesn't look that hexagonal, but still, it looks kind of like that. But you see, it's different. It's got these other modes here, and it's also got this degree of asymmetry. It's got red, red here, and not there. And, it, and then we're going to go to the asymmetric beaded stripes. These were symmetric right, left, and these are not. This has, these are different from this, which is nothing. And so now it goes into this cycle where it switches between the quasi-hexagons like this and the quasi-hexagons like this, and the asymmetric beaded stripes like this and the asymmetric beaded stripes like that. Okay, so you see, you can see it from the fact that you have this kind of beaded stripes has this, the other kind has this. Oops, I keep doing, hitting the wrong one. Oh, it's still again. Um, and the quasi-hexagons, this one has this and this one has that. Is that clear visually? And you can also see the quasi-hexagon are different. Um, well, anyway, there are two different kinds. And so the ones we're going to track in time are okay. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you sample the those Fourier modes, the amplitude of the Fourier modes in time, when you have hexagons, all three of these, the brown, the black, and the blue, have equal amplitude. That's the brown, the blue, and the black. This, this, and this, they have equal amplitude. Now, when it becomes the, the stripes, this one, this is the one that's the striped one, the blue one here, and the other ones have pretty much gone away. But what has happened is you have this other mode that has come up, and that's this one. It's not on the hexagon, but that's the one that does those, those beads there, okay? So it goes up, and so that's what the alternation looks like, and so what we plot is black minus brown and black plus brown, and we don't plot this because it doesn't change. And this other this other mode here. And in that in that um, in those coordinates, the cycle looks like this in time. You start off with the hexagons. That's this, and then you go to the beaded stripes, and then you go to the uh, you go to the asymmetric hexagons and the, uh, the beaded. You know, you do this over and over and over and over. So that's what it looks like. And so the whole thing is not at all finished. Uh, I say there's many unopened um, unanswered questions here. Um, is this related to the competition squares and hexagons in large domain? I mean, I've said all this, but remember I said before that I cheated because it's only one box. We made it be hexagons. And my, my kind of theory is that um, 
a, a, a conservation of complexity that's safe. You force it to be in a small box and don't let it do all kinds of chaos and so on. It'll do something complicated, uh, spatially chaotic. It'll, um, it'll do something temporally complicated. And if you let it be in a big box where it can do something spatially complicated, it'll be less temporally complicated. That's you know, just talk. Uh, you know, kind of philosophical talk. So this is in a this is in a domain with one hexagon in it, and so it's kind of uh, so in my way of thinking, it's kind of forced to do something interesting temporally. Well, the T1 and the T2 are transients. What it's doing constant, that those, those things it does at first, and then it does two, three, four, five, six, three, four, five, six, three, four, five, six. Yes, uh, it looks to me as though it's, uh, uh, it looks to us as though it's, uh, it's pretty regular there. Yes, yes, we think, uh, we think that. And then we don't know how it arises at all. Um, okay, so we don't know, okay, the big, this is, so this is not realistic because realistically you don't have one hexagon in a periodic box. What you have is a large box. And what you have is this competition between squares and hexagons and that, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that's really an answered question. There are symmetry theories in square domains, square grids, symmetry theories in hexagonal grids, but the, the, the competition between the two, and when you go over from one to the other experimentally, I don't think that is, if it's done, it's not very complete. Uh, anyway, I don't know it. So is this thing that the hexagons, when it's forced to be hexagons do, is that related to the competition between squares and hexagons? What would happen in a larger domain if you, if you made four of these cells, would it still do that or would it start to do something more complicated spatially and simpler temporally? Don't know. Um, we don't even know restricted to this. If you don't think what would happen, what is happening? What is this behavior in a dynamical systems point of view? Is this a heteroclinic orbit? Is this, uh, how did it come about? Uh, we don't know that, even just taking that to, um, and is this a common scenario in a minimal hexagonal grid, uh, grid? I would say that it is uh, because anything you see, uh, you know, you saw at random. It's very unlikely that you would see something that only occurs exceptionally. So kind of, it's like the, um, what do you call it, the anthropic principle, right? What's the anthro, uh, that, you know, the world has to be this way for us to see it uh, because otherwise, isn't, isn't it something like that? Right, so the fact that we just did this and we found this shows that it's, uh, not so unlikely because we found it. Now that's not complete demonstration, but isn't that, you know, again, ph philosophy. So we don't know any of those things. So that's the end of this, this story. And then I go to some other stories which are much less complete. So I'm not gonna do stories that are as long as the hexagonal, but that's what I was kind of asking permission to do. I, I know it's difficult. Okay, so we, now we switch gears. Everybody all uh, were so happy with this that my colleagues who know about free service codes, they went and built this huge code that does, that, that's all very high, par it's parallelized. And this is, I wrote, tested up to 65,000 processors. That was a few years ago. I bet by now they're up to, uh, they've doubled that. They, they, they like this and they do huge, huge grids. And so I'm just gonna show you the first thing that we found with it. It's these patterns called super squares and now, this is a grid of squares, so it's not just one square as we saw before. This is, this is the size of the computational domain here. Before the size of the computational, oh, I'm sorry, I keep hitting this by mistake. Before the size of the computational domain was uh, one of these, but now it's this, so much, much bigger. It's, it's, this is 20 times 20 times as big, because 20 times in this direction, 20 times in this direction, so it's <coughs> 400 times as big. And you can see what it did spontaneously. Again, this is a system, we didn't make it do it. It, it breaks up into a kind of waffle. This and this are in phase temporally and spatially, and this and this are temporally and spatially in phase, and it just decided to do that. This is a cut through the height, through one of these. You see that here you have minima where you have maxima here, and that's what you're seeing here, and then vice versa. So this goes with just one stripe here. Okay, so uh, that was the next thing that we studied. And so now we have the possibility of studying spatial complexity, uh, which we have done. Okay, and that's all I'm telling you about that. Oh, and it turned out, again, this was, we found this, and it turned out that some experimentalists had found something very similar. This is uh, 20 years before our work. And there's a picture like this, um, uh, but it's only a picture, this photograph, because at the time they could not do spatiotemporal 
uh, measurements of the surface. So they just surmised this. They didn't do Fourier analysis, which we were able to do. But it was nice to see this uh, had shown up in experiment. OK, so that's the end of story two. So you see that was short. Now story three is a little bit longer, but it's not so complicated as the hexagons. It should take me about five or so minutes to go through it. <coughs> we can study a variant of the problem, which is not uh, the um, a flat surface like this, but a spherical version of it where you impose an oscillating uh, 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 radial gravity. So there it is. This is, um, this is oscillating gravity. So it's a spherical version of the problem. And otherwise, this is Navier-Stokes. And uh, so oh, we did the linear stability analysis. This Again, this is the work of uh, Aligo Ebo Adu, entirely his work. Here. So the general way you treat spheres is with a poloidal toroidal decomposition and spherical harmonics instead of plane waves. Um, uh, this is just general things that you always do with spheres. Um, uh, so you have the radius plus a periodic, um, a, a, this has a spatial dependence and the, and the periodic dependent, uh, excuse me, the temporal dependence is flo a floquet form as before. And so everything that we did that was planar goes over to spherical like this. Um, so here's the surface height, and here's the dispersion relation. And so um, you wanted to see who wanted to see the dispersion relation? Uh, there. Okay. So here, here's the inviscid dispersion relation in the uh, planar case, which I wrote over there. And then here's the inviscid. Um, uh, this is also Lamb and Rayleigh in the sphere. And again, it's the same kind of thing. If you take a bubble uh, or a sphere and you change its shape in a certain way in what frequency does it oscillate, or the other way around. If you oscillate a certain frequency, what shape will it take on? Now, there's something I want you to note about this one compared to that one. It looks kind of similar. You might say K, that's like L of the spherical harmonics, but not quite. Yes, here you have L over R, and that has the right dimensions. Remember, in planes, the wave number has dimensions of 1 over distance, whereas L is an integer, so you need the over R to make it dimensionally correct. So this is fine. But then if you look here, you don't have L cubed. You have something cubic, yes, but you have L, L minus 1, L plus 2. And why is that? That is because before you were linearizing about 0, here you're linearizing about something that already has curvature. A sphere already has curvature. So this is what the calculation that Lamb did was to linearize about something that already had curvature. But now I want you to look at here, and you see that L equals 0 is a special case. Well, you always expect L equals 0 to be a special case. But L equals 1 is also a special case. OK, and let's see why that is. We're going to now do, uh, do this for six different Ls. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. OK, this is, again, this is just the things that go over the, in the calculation. So now we have this, this floquet tongues here. This is frequency and amplitude. Remember I said before, before I varied, I said that you could fix the frequency and vary the wave number, or I could fix the wave number and vary the frequency. So here I'm varying the frequency, and I'm exciting different Ls, different, different Ks here, but different Ls, those spherical uh, harmonic Ls. OK. Now, Again, the big difference between k and l is that k is just quantitative. A small k is like this. It's a big wave number. A big k is like this. But l, different l's are very different. They're the spherical harmonics. l equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are qualitatively different. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Um, these are the, uh, we did simulations at these different values. And these are the pictures that we saw. This is L equals 3, so it looks like a tetrahedron. This is L equal 4, so this looks like an octahedron, and we'll see that in just a moment. This is L equal 5. You can see 5 for a pentagon up here. L equal 6 is like a dodecahedron. But let's see more. Precisely, let's go back to, uh, let's, let's look at an L equal 2 pattern, what it looks like. So this is now. You see not only the shape, this, I like this movie, you see the shape, but you also see the velocity field. Don't pay attention to that. I should hide it. It's uh, of no importance. It's just it's junk here. So you see this velocity field, and you see this, the, you see this uh, it's, it's, um, it oscillates between an oblate and prolate shape. Oblo oblate is like a, a little bit like a rugby ball, or, uh, and the prolate is kind of more like a frisbee. Um, 
But now you're going to, okay, so now it's getting to full height, uh, full amplitude. It's, it's getting excited, and then it won't reach its limiting amplitude. But you may see already what it's doing. You, it's, it starts by being subtle, but then it's not subtle anymore. Or what do you see besides its large amplitude? What do you see besides its large amplitude? It's, that's right, it's processing. It's no longer lined up like this. And it's doing that more and more. Um, it's processing. And again, this too, I don't think that that is known, that, uh, that such a thing. I mean, it's known that L equal 2 is a prolate oblate oscillation. Yes, that part is known. That's in group, classic group theory. But this, its procession, uh, I think, is not known. And there's a puzzle for uh, mathematicians. Well, it's, it's, okay, I'll show you, a, I think I can show you a complete picture. Yes, okay, it's going to, it's not just, okay, uh, so this is now interesting, kind of, those who like spheres, okay, spherical harmonics, they have L and M. You know, if you were in a plane, you'd have, say, K and L, and they would be very normal things. But L and M are not the same. L is the, um, is like, lat just as latitude and longitude are not the same, right? Latitudinal circles have different, like, and longitude are all, um, uh, every place on the longitude is the same, but every place in the latitude is not. Okay, so too, M is not unique. Um, if you represent something, if something of this shape and you rotate it, it has the same shape, but it changes its M. This, uh, an axisymmetric, something that's axisymmetric, if it's, uh, if it's oriented in the z-axis, has M equals zero axisymmetric. This is not axisymmetric anymore because it's not symmetric, and it's got different M's. So the M tells you about position as well as the shape. L is a pure thing. L does not change as you rotate an object, but M does. So if you know the position, if it's staying, if it's fixing this position, and M is changing, then the shape is changing. If you know the shape and the M changes, then it's the position that's changing. So aside from the oscillation, just the general axis, what, this is now, Oh, excuse me. This is um, an envelope, like what we we're showing before. So this is not the oscillation. This is just sampled every every maximum. And here you see the M spectrum, and you see it's you know it's not even just going in one direction. I don't think it's just rotating. I think its precession is is perhaps chaotic. That's what it seems to be here. I'm not sure, uh, but I think it's. I don't know. I don't know. And this merits. This could be a whole study. And so I've gone around. Speaking about this, I don't think people have done this study of why does an oblate, prolate, oscillating pattern process. But this is the procession. You see here, here's the red uh, poles over here, the red poles are over there. And that's what you see from the M spectrum um, quantitatively. Um, then we have the three, four, five, six stories. And the, 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 um, the basic, um, the leaders of symmetry theory are these people. There's this huge paper by Melbourne Chaussat and Lauterbach, oh, it's maybe 100 pages long. It's in Acta Mathematica something or other. And it's, it's really a complete analysis of this low L cases. And um, OK, so here now we say just, I, I wouldn't possibly understand it, but uh, not in detail, but I understand the pictures. But here's something that everybody can understand. Um, the platonic solids. Platonic solids are, um, are when you, uh, you take this, uh, the, same, um, the same polygon and you uh, match them up together. And there are only these five. These are the five platonic solids, right? So that you make up a tetrahedron by four triangles. You make up a cube by four squares. You make up an octahedron by eight triangles. And you make up a dodecahedron by 12 pentagons. And an icosahedron by um, 20 um, triangles. OK, so that's concept one. Concept two, duals. Duals, you change the vertices into, uh, into faces and the faces into vertices. The cube and the octahedron are duals of one another. This one has six faces and eight vertices. This one has eight faces and six vertices. You squash the vertices and you expand the, uh, the faces and you get each other. These are duals of one another. Clear? Same thing with dodecahedron and icosahedron. You make a, a point in the middle, and you make all of these flat, and you get the icosahedron. 12 faces, uh, 20 vertices, and this one has 20 faces and 12 vertices. Okay, So these are duals, these are duals, and this one is self-dual. You do that to this tetrahedron, and it becomes an upside-down tetrahedron. 
And indeed, this, these oscillating drops are a perfect way to see this because you're going, basically you're going from, I mean, if you take the maximum to be like a vertex and the minimum to be like a face, well then you're going between it and its dual. That's what it's doing in time. So that's true for three, four, five, six. That's why I said it now. And uh, so you can have these, these uh, formula, it was done by Busa. And here are movies of the tetrahedron doing its uh, dual thing. This is the tetrahedron. And this is the L equal four doing its cube, octahedron, uh, uh, cube octagon thing, octahedron thing. Cube, octahedron, cube, octahedron, cu uh, octahedron, cube, octahedron. And these are simulations of the, uh, the full fluid simulations. And again, you can study precession and stuff with these spectra. And you see that these two shapes do not have precession, the three and the four. Um, the five and the six, you can see also oscillating in their way. And um, there are two different uh, five patterns. And here's the six pattern. Again, you can follow its, um, uh, its uh, spectra. And then finally, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. Um, remember I said we were going to do one, two, three, four, five, six, right? But I, we started at two with oblate, prolate, and then we went to the platonic solids, three, four, five, six. But we didn't do one yet. So here is one. Everybody ready? Right? I said it was special. This is one. Boing, 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 boing. Okay, so um, now you see why it's special. It's not changing shape. It can't. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, this, is, this is what L equal one does. We were surprised. We thought L equal one is not possible. But if you go back, it's impossible for pure capillary waves. Um, if you go back to here, uh, the, the formula, this is L over R here. And this is uh, G. And this is sigma over rho L minus L, L minus one, L plus two. So it's weird as far as surface tension goes. Surface tension will make you make these waves. It doesn't like being curved, so it will come back and do this. But surface tension has nothing, when you're doing this, the shape isn't changing. It has nothing to do with surface tension. Surface tension is not changing the curvature. So it's weird as far as surface tension goes, but it's not weird for gravity waves. And that's the gravity waves that are doing that. So I said we did just surface, just sigma, just G, and uh, combinations. And I think that's the end of what I have to say. Oh, yeah, well, there's a current project. I'll just show you a movie. This is an experiment. And this is a square pattern. And look what it's doing. And I'm, I started to do this problem with a uh, summer student, Raul Agrawal from um, IIT uh, Bombay. And so we started doing that with this um, twisted uh, lattice pattern there. Okay, so that's, that's the end there. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.